Good afternoon, and welcome to the fifth and final installment of the virtual Abraham Lincoln Institute Symposium, hosted by Ford's Theater. Sorry, am I live? My, my name is Jonathan White, and I'm the chairman of the board of the Abraham Lincoln Institute. Normally we meet, normally we meet at Ford's Theater every March to hear wonderful speakers talk about the life and legacy of our 16th president. This year we had to cancel our annual symposium but we are grateful to Fords for offering to host a series of live webcasts with our speakers. I want to thank ALI President Ron Sudalter for making arrangements with our speakers. I'd also like to thank the team at Fords for making it all happen. In particular, I'd like to thank Paul Tatro, Erica Scott, Carolina Dulcy, Gary Erskine, Juliana Avery, Colleen Pryor, Lauren B.A., and David McKenzie. Throughout the lecture, you can post questions on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. Our speaker will address them at the end of the program. Our speaker today is Jason Emerson. Jason is a member of the ALI Board of Directors and an independent historian and journalist living near Syracuse, New York. He's the author or editor of seven books about Abraham Lincoln and his family, including The Madness of Mary Lincoln and Giant in the Shadows, The Life of Robert T. Lincoln. Today, he will be speaking about his recent book, Mary Lincoln for the Ages, which was published by Southern Illinois University Press in 2019. One reviewer calls it the go-to source for scholars and general writers researching Mary Lincoln. It is my pleasure to welcome Jason Emerson. All right, thank you, John. It's wonderful to be here uh, digitally, <laughs> which I've never done before, so it's very exciting. Now, Mary Lincoln is arguably one of the most fascinating first ladies in all of American history, and she is certainly one of the most written about. While no recent comparisons of the number of biographical works of first ladies has been accomplished, uh, there's one from 2003 that shows Mary Lincoln to be the fourth most written about first lady behind only Eleanor Roosevelt, Hillary Clinton, and Jackie Kennedy. I know that was a while ago, and considering publication trends, I, I think it's safe to assume Mary is still fourth, unless Abigail Adams, who has had a number of books about her in recent years, has overtaken her. Now, in my five books and more than 10 years researching and writing about Mary Lincoln, I've come to simultaneously admire, pity, and often dislike her. Interestingly, one modern poet who contributed to my recent book, Lincoln's Lover, Mary Lincoln and Poetry, said that from my writing and from my own poem on Mary in that book, she thinks that I sound like I'm actually a little bit in love with her, which I think some other people would disagree with. Um, but for many years, I've been wondering, discussing, and arguing over interpretations of Mary. And the underlying theme has always been, do people really understand Mary Lincoln? And of course, any education and understanding of Mary comes from the available sources and later scholarship on her life. Now, after reading, digesting, and analyzing more than 400 writings about Mary over the past few years for my book, Mary Lincoln for the Ages, which John was nice enough to flash up on screen, uh, this, this book is part narrative historical inquiry and part analytical bibliography. And after all of that research, I have concluded that no, we do not really understand who Mary Lincoln was and how and why she came to be that way. Now, Mary has all the ingredients of a fascinating life both as her own person and as her husband's wife. She had a dramatic and at times traumatic childhood, an impressive education and high intelligence, a dramatic broken engagement and last minute, last minute wedding to Abraham Lincoln, multiple years of domestic normalcy as wife and mother, years as grieving wife and mother surrounded by family deaths, four years as first lady during a civil war, numerous scandals and headlines as first lady, her presence at her husband's assassination, her years as a widow, many spent as a homeless wanderer around the world, a belief in spiritualism and recorded attendance at seances, public scandals, commitment to a sanitarium, years in self-imposed exile, and a lifelong history of physical and mental illnesses. Now, all of this has contributed to her rich and textured appeal and subsequently large bibliography. But what makes Mary more compelling as a historical figure is that her life is not obvious. She has been characterized as an enigma and disagreements abound in interpreting her story. Was she a loving wife or a shrew? 
an altruistic woman, or an insular egotist, a laudable first lady, or an unethical opportunist who enriched herself at public expense, a mentally ill woman, or a misrepresented victim of male chauvinist society, a fitting partner to the first martyred president, or an embarrassment to her husband's legacy, a historical charity case, or a significant historical figure, or was Mary Lincoln a combination of all of these things? In a February 1973 newspaper article titled, Has History Wronged Mary Lincoln? Historian Herbert Mitgang offers an impressively discerning consideration of Mary's life and historical reputation, which Mitgang labels akin to a Greek tragedy. He declares her to be an enigmatic daguerreotype sitting uncomfortably in the shadow of her husband. After reading over 400 writings about Mary Lincoln, that quote has been probably the most impactful of everything I've ever read about her. An enigmatic daguerreotype sitting uncomfortably in the shadow of her husband. And it's true. Even as perceptions and interpretations of Mary have changed through the years and across the generations, she will forever be the shade to Abraham Lincoln's light. And in fact, for decades after the assassination, Mary Lincoln rarely was written about as anything more than Abraham Lincoln's wife. All the books and articles were about Abraham, with Mary as a minor character, if she was mentioned at all. She was the loving little woman by his side, described by her physical appearance and her wardrobe, and the fact that she kept the clean and loving home within which a great man dwelled as he rose to prominence. The exceptions during this time were Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon's lectures and writings about Abraham Lincoln that touched on Mary, and also the memoir by Mary's dressmaker, Elizabeth Keckley. Both of these books caused innumerable damage to Mary and to her reputation at the time, but have since become realized as invaluable historical touchstones. Herndon made some of the worst and also some of the best characterizations of Mary ever written, although it is the negative comments that have endured. From Herndon, we learn that Mary was a harpy and a shrew. She made Abraham Lincoln's life a living hell. She was cold, calculating and self-centered, and she drove him out of the house and into greatness. Keckley, on the other hand, wrote with the positive intentions of showing the world Mary Lincoln's true nature so that everyone could see that she was a good woman who just had some peculiarities. Keckley portrays Mary as a loving wife and mother and a strong-willed and loyal first lady, while also showing her to be high-tempered, filled with fear and anxiety, self-centered, and often self-pitying. Keckley's book, which is an invaluable uh, piece of history, was viciously attacked and then utterly disregarded when it was published, however, because it was not only written by a black woman, but by a servant who abused her access to her patron. So it was really not valued as a historical source until well into the 20th century. And it was not until the turn of the 20th century that Mary Lincoln became to be seen as a historical figure in her own right. The first article about Mary as her own person was published in 1898 by her sister, Emily Todd Helm, while the first book about Mary was in 1928, a family approved biography written by her niece, Catherine Helm. At that time, Mary was straddling the line between being the practically anonymous side character of Abraham Lincoln's wife and having a greater historical identity as Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, the president's companion and partner who also had her own life. This is also evident in Elizabeth Todd Grimsley's 1926 article about her cousin Mary, Six Months in the White House, although that was actually written in 1894. Now, all three of these writings by Todd family members who certainly had vested interests in improving their kinswoman's reputation offered reminiscences, stories, interviews, and conclusions that sought to let the admirable qualities of Mary shine brighter than the scandal and rumor that had clouded her story. It was not until 1932 that the first objective books on Mary Lincoln were published by writers who sought to give readers an unalloyed, professionally approached examination of her unique character and historical life. In quick succession, the books Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, A Study of Her Personality by W.A. Evans and Mary Lincoln, Wife and Widow by Carl Sandburg and Paul Engel offered carefully researched data-driven biographies of Mary that not only detailed the episodes and incidents of her life, but also undertook to better understand her personality and character. Evans said, quote, very few people think of Mrs. Lincoln at all or have any real opinion about her. This does not prevent many of them from repeating somewhat superficially what they have read or heard about her. 
If such expressions can be called a prevailing opinion, then one may say that it is generally accepted that Mrs. Lincoln was and is not deserving of the goodwill of her fellow countrymen. But as both Evans and Sandberg made clear, Mary was far more complex and far less reprehensible than anyone really understood or portrayed up to that time. As Han Sandberg said, quote, so all the babblings about her are only a vain exercise in the tongues of those who misunderstand. By the 1940s and 50s, Mary grew fully into the character of Mrs. Abraham Lincoln. True to the social mores of the time, Mary began being seen and interpreted as a June Cleaver type character of wife, mother, and housekeeper, but also as a solid companion for her husband, without whom he would not be complete. The pinnacle of this point of view came with Ruth Painter Randall's 1953 book, Mary Lincoln Biography of a Marriage. Randall's main accomplishment in her excellent, though defiantly sympathetic book, was to firmly disprove Herndon's damning conclusions that Abraham Lincoln never loved his wife because of his love for Anne Rutledge, and that he left Mary standing at the altar in 1841. By the 1980s, with the rise of feminist revisionism, biographical work on Mary Lincoln went in a new direction, and with it, Mary as Mrs. Abraham Lincoln gave way to her being identified and recognized as Mary Todd Lincoln, her own woman, a woman ahead of her times, a woman apart from her husband, with her own ideas and strengths, who was battling against a patriarchal society. This historical pivot was most clearly defined in Jean Baker's 1987 book, Mary Todd Lincoln, A Biography, the book that to this day remains the most popular and most referenced work on Mary Lincoln, despite its many and serious flaws. Baker's work is a revisionist psychobiography of Mary Lincoln with an overt feminist agenda that portrays her as a female pioneer in a chauvinistic society. Baker's work is fairly well researched and offers some of the best context for Mary's life that can be found as far as understanding the social and political mores of the time for women of Mary Lincoln's social status. And this was a status that was ever changing, going from an aristocratic upbringing to a middle-class midlife, to a stint as first lady, and then a fall to a lonely and publicly discarded widow. While Baker does show some of Mary's faults as well as her virtues, the end result is more defensive and exculpatory than objective. Since the turn of the millennium in 2000, Mary has become a feminist icon. Her reputation is that she was actually the brains behind the bumpkin Lincoln. She wrote his speeches, she advised him on policy, and she was really Hillary Clinton 150 years too soon, which is ridiculous. While personal bias and political agendas always have been and will remain historical stumbling blocks, this interpretation, unsupported by any facts, has become the dominant theory about who Mary was in recent years. Mary's admirers and defenders constantly seek to place her on a pedestal as high or higher than her husband's. Unfortunately, such historical revisionism, or more accurately, such presentism, fails to account for Mary as she was during the time in which she lived. Much of the blame for the insubstantial writings about Mary Lincoln in recent years can be placed on writers' shallow understanding of Mary based on their constant rehashing of the same tired works about her used under the same predilections and presuppositions. There are really only seven major works that have become what I call the common canon of Mary Lincoln. Out of more than 300 nonfiction writings about Mary Lincoln, these seven that everybody uses equal about 2%. So these books are the main informers of what the general public, journalists, general writers and historians, essayists, book reviewers, and even many Lincoln scholars use when they need information about Mary, for better or worse. Some of these books are excellent. Some of them are flawed, vitiated by bias. All of them, it can be argued, are outdated. These books are Herndon's Lincoln by William Herndon, Keckley's Behind the Scenes, Catherine Helms' Mary, Wife of Lincoln, Ruth Painter Randall's Biography of Marriage, Jean Baker's Mary Todd Lincoln, A Biography, a book by the Turners, Mary Todd Lincoln, Her Life and Letters, and if you're interested in the insanity case, uh, the insanity file by Mark Neely and R. Gerald McMurtry. Now, a few choice quotations from Mary's contemporaries, typically negative and critical, are often quoted by modern writers, such as those by Presidential Secretary John Hay, and his line, the Hellcat is getting more Hellcatical day by day, and also William Stoddard, but those are merely punctuative points rather than anchoring source material. 
Really, there are two books more than any others that are the foundation for everything else written, spoken, and believed about Mary, and that is Herndon's Lincoln by Herndon and Jean Baker's biography. These two books are responsible for both showing Mary as she was during the time in which she lived and completely corrupting any honest understanding of her character by the overt biases these authors bring into their works. By continuing to base our knowledge of Mary on these two sources, actually the seven I mentioned, rather than simply incorporating their positive aspects as small pieces of a larger canon of research, the lies, the false stories, the misunderstandings and misinterpretations of who Mary truly was will not only never end, but will continue to be perpetuated by future writers and historians. Every generation requires a new interpretation of any historical figure or event. And for our generation, there are so many great sources on Mary Lincoln's life that need to be acknowledged and used to better understand exactly who Mary was. Some of these overlooked sources include the writings by the White House secretaries, Nicolay Hay and Stoddard. You know, everybody uses that John Hay quote I mentioned, but between the three of them, they have dozens or more articles and books all about Mary Lincoln that nobody ever uses. There are amazing medical sources about Mary. Two, fairly recent, that I definitely recommend. Um, there is a book by Mary Lee Esty called Conquering Concussion, which is about traumatic brain injury. And there's an entire chapter about Mary's carriage accident in 1863. And there's a book by Glenna, Sch Glenna Schroeder Line called Lincoln and Medicine, which is about Abraham Lincoln, but has a great, many great passages about Mary Lincoln. Another article that I think is essential that everybody should read is Michael Burlingame's um, Mary Lincoln's Unethical Conduct as First Lady. No matter what you think of Mary Lincoln, you cannot deny the facts of what she did as First Lady, even though many people try to deny those. Um, this article lays everything out, and you cannot ignore what Mary did if you're trying to understand who she was. And one of my favorite books that I recommend to everybody is actually not even about Mary Lincoln. It is by Stephen Barry, and it's called House of Abraham, Lincoln and the Todds. And this book is about the Todd family. And it's amazing because if you understand the family, you understand Mary Lincoln because she is one of them. And you see that she is not some aberration as a person. She was a Todd. And they're all very similar. And Abraham Lincoln knew exactly who she was when he married her. He didn't get caught off guard by some surprise after they got married. So those are just a few of the books that I think need to be included in the canon. Now, I've come to this conclusion after reading more than 400 writings about Mary Lincoln, all of which are in this book. Uh, newspaper articles, songs, poems, plays, scholarly articles, fiction, nonfiction. I've read them all, mostly multiple times. And the education I received from this was invaluable. I've tracked down elusive sources, found original sources for secondhand statements, and had some surprises and some interesting realizations. Uh, some of these include the multiple primary sources that exist discussing the reasons for the Lincoln Todd broken engagement. Mary's belief in spiritualism and her attendance at seances, uh, particularly when she had her spirit photo taken by William Mumler in Boston. Mumler wrote an article about her visit about three months after she was there. Most people don't know that. I've never looked at it. And then just the happiness or unhappiness of the Lincolns as a married couple. Now, certain topics about Mary have been written many times. The most frequent is her insanity case, followed by her relationship with William Herndon and the fatal 1st of January broken engagement. But in addition to all of these fascinating stories that I found, um, there's a lot of things about Mary that I did not find in all of my research. And this impacts not just the bibliography, but also our understanding of who Mary was. In general, most historians don't make enough use of contemporary journalism, which is called the first draft of history, typically. Not only do these historic newspaper reportings hold the original reports of historic incidents, but they also typically interview people who were there and who saw what happened. Similarly, there are vast writings from the late 19th and early 20th centuries about Mary that have been forgotten through the years. Mary's childhood definitely needs more examination, as does a specific treatise on her experience with slaves and her changing opinions on blacks and slavery. And of course, the glaring hole in Mary's bibliography is her years living in Europe. She was there for seven years, and to date, 
no scholar has ever actually gone to Europe to research in the archives there to find out what she did. And that, quite frankly, is inexcusable. So what is the point of reviewing and analyzing this canon of Mary Lincoln and why do we care? Well, I think it offers a roadmap to a better understanding of this historic person that Mary Lincoln was, which not incidentally impacts our understanding of Abraham Lincoln, to whom she was married for 23 years. To see when and by whom and under what historic predilections the scholarship on her began and from where it has progressed, not only elucidates the value of each subsequent writing, but also edifies the perspective of current Mary Lincoln scholars and enthusiasts. All of these writings, whether succinct or verbose, whether large or small, are additional pieces to the fascinating and incomplete puzzle of this incredible woman. They add further illumination to what remains a largely misunderstood and misinterpreted life of one of America's most captivating first ladies. As Elizabeth Keckley said, Mrs. Lincoln was the most peculiarly constituted woman imaginable. Search the world over and you will not find her like. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, that was wonderful. We've gotten some questions in. The first one has to do with Mary Lincoln and spiritualism. Could you talk a little bit about that aspect of her life and also how historians have maybe thought about that issue? Absolutely. Um, she was deeply involved in spiritualism. Um, it's unclear exactly when it started. Some people say it was in Springfield, spiritualists came through town. Some people say Elizabeth Keckley got her into it. Some people say that uh, other people that Mary knew in Washington um, got her involved in spiritualism. Uh, you know, the books and articles and everything about the topic basically all focus on Abraham Lincoln. And they talk about Mary as the side character of, really, she was the one interested and Lincoln would tag along. Typically, everyone who's written about it was a spiritualist. So their take is always mm -hmm. that Abraham Lincoln was a spiritualist because that's their message. Um, and there hasn't been anything written on this, anything of value written on this in decades. Um, I have a folder that's immensely thick. That's one of my projects I haven't done yet is hmm. a treatise on Marian spiritualism um, because it really is fascinating. I mean, it, it, it talks about, you know, it gets to the root of everybody she loved dies. So she believed in spiritualism so she could reconnect with them. And that also connects to her insanity because, you know, if she's talking to dead people through spiritualists, was she crazy or was she simply religious? Um, that, that's a very interesting question that's, that I've raised many times. Right. Can you talk a little bit about her relationship with Elizabeth Keckley, their friendship during the war and in the immediate aftermath of Lincoln's assassination? Well, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I personally, I don't know if I would call them friends. Hmm. I, I, they were to a degree, but in my opinion, Elizabeth Keckley was really Mammy Sally. She was Mary's Mammy Sally when Mary was an adult. And to that end, yes, she trusted her. Maybe they were friends. She cried on her shoulder. She had Elizabeth help her, you know, the old clothes scandal, things like that. But still, she was her servant. She was still lesser than Mary was, as Mary believed most people were. Um, and so, you know, I, I hesitate to call her a friend, quite frankly. I know people will disagree with that. But um, there's no doubt that Mary needed her, especially after the assassination. Because, you know, during the White House years, because of Mary's own bad behavior and the way she treated people, she alienated everybody, all of her family, all of her friends, nearly all. But Keckley was always there. Mm -hmm. So she went with the Lincolns to Chicago. She went with Mary to New York for the old clothes sale what has become the old clothes scandal. Um, although, you know, Mary promised her all this money if she helped her out, which she never came through with. Now, when Keckley wrote her book, uh, Mary was furious and she never mentioned her again in any of her letters that survive, except hmm. one where she calls her that colored historian. Huh. Now, Elizabeth Keckley was interviewed by John Washington in his book, They Knew Lincoln. And she claimed that uh, she and Mary never had a falling out, that Mary was not mad about the book and that they remained friends until Mary's death, which I find hard to believe because there's not a shred of evidence anywhere that supports that. Right, right. Since you touched on it, can you talk about Mary's unethical behavior as first lady, the scandals and so forth, some of those things? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting. She... 
you know, you kind of have to delve into her psyche a little bit. A, a lot of the problem was about money because a lot of the Lincoln's expenses they had to pay out of their own pocket. Some of it was paid for by the government, but, and Mary always felt that she was destitute. I think part of this is growing up in, you know, with a rich family and then marrying a middle-class lawyer, there was never enough money. But then even when there was enough money, Mary never felt that there was enough money. And so, you know, she would do things, um, you know, have the gardener sell the manure out of the stable and she would pocket the money and give him a couple bucks. Um, you know, one of the biggest unethical things she did was it's it's quite um, proven quite uh, securely that she sold Abraham Lincoln's first message to Congress to a journalist. Um, and, you know, a congressional committee actually convened over it and Abraham Lincoln said, you know, please don't talk about this. I'll, I'll straighten it out. So there were things like that. Mary got friends of hers, got them jobs. She, anytime people gave her gifts, she just could not resist flattery or gift giving of any kind. And so she did a lot of unethical things if they involved her getting something in return. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, we got a question about Mary's life in Europe that you mentioned after the assassination. You said that there's been no research done in Europe about it. What do we know about that visit? You know, not too much. Um, in the Turner's book, Mary Lincoln, Her Life and Letters, there is, I'm not sure how many letters, 20 or so, I'm not sure, uh, but they're all to her banker and they're all about her finances. And mm -hmm. that's pretty much it. Now, when I discovered um, what have been called Mary's Lost Insanity Letters, uh, the letters, most of which she wrote when she was in Bellevue Place Sanitarium, and then some that she wrote after. Some of those were letters she wrote from Europe. So those letters show a little bit more. They show where she was, what she was doing, what she was visiting, who she was with. You know, Myra Bradwell, her accomplice in getting out of the asylum, visited her in Europe. Uh, Mary visited her friend Sally Orne. We knew that. Mary went to Italy. She went to Germany. She went to France. Um, but that's about it. We don't really know too much. Um, you know, I've talked to a few scholars in the last couple of years, and there's beginning to be interest with people who want to understand what Mary did in Europe. So I know there are a few people who are starting to look in the German archives, the French archives, even in London. Mary visited a few people in London and lived there for a while. So I think that that is a, an area that's about to pop open. At least I hope so. How long was she overseas? Seven years total. She was there for three years from 68 to 71. And then when she was declared restored to reason, she was there from 76 to 80, I believe. 80, okay. 81. Yeah, to 80. Um, so yeah, seven years total, two different times. And so on the topic of Mary's health, we got another question from a viewer asking about a carriage accident she was in. If you could talk about that and if it's possible that might have caused any sort of brain injury. Absolutely. I, I think it's likely. So the carriage accident was in 63. It was actually in July as the Battle of Gettysburg was raging. Mary was driving to the White House from the soldier's home and the seat of the carriage fell off. So the driver fell off. The horses got scared. They took off at full speed. The only way that Mary could escape, she jumped out of the carriage as it was going full speed. She bashed her head on a rock. Uh, luckily, this occurred right in front of a Union hospital. Hmm. That was right next to the road. So the nurses and doctors rushed out. Um, they were like, oh, you're okay. Some bumps and bruises. But she had a gash on her head that actually became infected, and she nearly died from it. But again, this was when uh, Battle of Gettysburg is raging. Her husband, obviously, he saw her, but he was, he was a little busy. Robert was away. Abraham told him his mother was injured. Robert didn't come home to visit. And then it turned out that it was discovered that that was an assassination attempt. The seat had been tampered with. Oh. So Mary was terrified of assassination attempts. So that immediately caused her great anxiety. But, you know, a lot of doctors since then that have written about this wonder if, you know, the one book I mentioned, Traumatic Brain Injury, mm -hmm. Robert said after that accident, his mother was never the same. Hmm. And that's what he said. So, you know, I, I take that as in general, she was never the same, could be part of her mental illness. I, I think she had mental illness. Um, so it's definitely a turning point in her life. And you mentioned the Todd family. There was mental illness in her family as well. Some yes. siblings and cousins. 
Yes, right? there are. I found 14 members of the Todd family that had mental illness of some sort, that had committed suicide, that had been committed to asylums. Uh, the book uh, House of Abraham, Lincoln and the Todds mm -hmm. by Stephen Berry that I mentioned, he goes into it in great detail. You know, one of Mary's brothers was the commandant of a Confederate prison camp, and he was uh, sadistic. He he literally murdered a Union officer and left him lying on the road for two or three days. And it was so sadistic that the Confederates actually removed him from command. I mean, how bad do you have to be for the Confederates to remove you for killing a Yankee? So, right, right. Wow. So you talked about the role that Herndon has played in shaping the image we have of Mary Lincoln. Can you tell us a little bit about why Herndon disliked Mary so much from their time back in Springfield when they were both younger before the presidency? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, you know, I always used to think that, and that's the regular understanding, but Doug Wilson wrote an amazing article. I believe it was just called William Herndon and Mary Todd Lincoln, in which I think he proves beyond a doubt that they did not hate each other during those years. I mean, you know, Mary thought he was a drunk. She didn't think he was in the same league as her husband. But um, I, I don't know that she hated him. And Herndon, the same thing. He thought Mary was snooty, and he thought that she was a little too big for her britches. But really, the break came in 66 when Herndon gave his Ann Rutledge lecture, in which he said, Lincoln never loved any woman except Ann Rutledge. And that's when they both started. Mary hated him, and then they started trading barbs. But you know, before that, in 65, Mary traveled from Chicago to Springfield specifically to sit with Herndon in a hotel room for a couple of hours and give him an interview. And their interview is in uh, Herndon's informants. Right. Book. So mm -hmm. really that came later. Um, and then it was, you know, because of Ann Rutledge and it just got worse from there. Um, but if you read Herndon's letters to his friends and various historians, it's amazing because he thought, he always thought, that he was Mary's friend. And he thought that everything that he said about her was to her benefit. So he said, you know, when I tell everyone, you know, Lincoln loved Ann Rutledge and never loved Mary, I'm actually doing her a favor. It's better if it comes from me because when then we all see that we know that they had a horrible marriage and it wasn't her fault. It was Lincoln's fault because he never really loved her anyways. <laughs> so a lot of the things he said, that was his rationale. That's interesting. So did Mary have falling outs with a number of people in the post-war years? You have Herndon there. You mentioned Keckley earlier. Are there other people that she had been close to during the war who then she is distanced from later? You know, not too many. She really uh, kind of drove everybody away during the war. Um, you know, Mary, I, I think it's pretty obvious if you look at the historical record. She thought as first lady that she was a queen and that she expected everyone to treat her as a queen. And if they didn't, she treated them like the plebeians that they were. So that drove a lot of people away. So by the time the war was over, Mary didn't have a whole lot of people left to talk to. Um, there was Keckley, uh, her friend Sally Orne, who was always her friend. Um, Elizabeth Slatiper was her friend that she met in the 70s, visiting health spas. One interesting thing that I discovered was, uh, so Myra Bradwell and James Bradwell, Mary met them, it's hard to say, could have been in the 1850s, possibly in the 60s, but we know that um, they lived in Chicago and Mary moved to Chicago after the war and they were friendly then. Myra Bradwell helped Mary get out of Bellevue Place Sanitarium and then they did not speak for an entire year, hmm. not a single word. And I've never seen any reason for why. My speculation is that uh, at some point, Robert Lincoln said to Myra Bradwell, listen, I will let my mother move to Springfield and let her have her money back, um, but you stay out of it. Because Myra Bradwell made Mary worse. Uh, it's a very long story, it's in all my books, but and that is just pure speculation on my part. I have no idea why else they would not speak for a year. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Myra Bradwell sends her a letter again and they start being friends and they, they tour a little bit of Europe together. Hmm. So it's a very interesting, we don't know what happened there. But other than that, I mean, that's about it. There aren't too many other people in Mary's life. Interesting. And part of that was by choice. Because right. Because he wanted to be alone. So we got another question on the sort of post-war period, and especially even, I guess, after Mary's death. Uh, the question has to do with how Lincoln's descendants viewed her. And is there any research that Mary Beckwith, Peggy Beckwith, 
um, tried to protect or save the family legacy? Oh, that's one of my favorite questions. Uh, I found an amazing book called Pictures on My Wall by Florence Snow. And Florence Snow, these are letters she wrote when she was a child, and she was friends with Mary Lincoln, Robert Lincoln's daughter, whom they called Mamie. And one time she was at the Harlan Lincoln home in Iowa while this was in um, 1882 after Mary Lincoln had died and her 70 plus trunks of possessions were at the, the Harlan Lincoln house in Iowa and Mary Harlan Lincoln, Robert Lincoln's wife, it was her job to go through everything. She called it this unconscionable accumulation. Hmm. And um, Florence Snow remembered asking Mamie, the granddaughter, you know, what do you think? about um, you know, the fact that Abraham Lincoln is your grandfather. And she said, oh, it's just, I, I don't know. I never knew him, but grandfather Harlan is here. And she said she really had nothing to say about Mary Todd Lincoln being her grandmother. Now the later generations, um, the last generation of Lincolns, which were Robert's grandchildren, which was uh, Peggy Beckwith, Robert Todd Lincoln Beckwith, or Bud, and Abraham Lincoln Isham. He went by Lincoln Isham, went by Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, all three of them did not have children. As far as we can tell, it was on purpose. All three of them hated, hated being Lincolns. They felt like sideshow freaks. They didn't talk about it. They rarely gave interviews. They donate, Lincoln Isham donated a lot of stuff to museums. Uh, Bud Beckwith, um, uh, he said, he was interviewed once, he said, I'm a spoiled brat. I like fast women, I like fast cars, and I like good booze. Hmm. And Peggy Beckwith just didn't care. She, uh, one of her, one of my favorite things about her was in the 60s, she, um, she christened the nuclear submarine Abraham Lincoln. Only time in her life she wore a dress. She always wore pants and she was a farmer and an aviator. And um, so she wrote in her diary what that moment meant to her. And the diary still exists. It's at Hildeen, Robert's home in Vermont. And it says, uh, cloudy AM, sunny PM, broke bottle on boat and home to bed. Huh. That's, they, they really didn't care about their connection to Lincoln. Wow. Yeah. It's kind of sad, but I also kind of understand it in a way. Right. Right. Wow. Can you, we only have a few minutes left. Um, can you briefly talk about the broken engagement? that you mentioned in 1841 and 42. What was going on there? How views of it by historians have changed over time? Sure, well there's, you know, Herndon said uh, Lincoln left Mary standing at the altar because he fell in love with her cousin, Matilda Edwards. A lot of writers have repeated that. Um, it's amazing how many interviews I found with people, in, mostly in newspapers, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, as far as what really happened. So all of Mary's sisters at some point wrote about what really happened that day. And a lot of her, you know, Springfield friends, and they all said the same thing. There was no leaving anybody at the altar. Um, I think, in my opinion, is what happened was, you know, Mary's family did not like Abraham Lincoln. They liked him personally. They did not think he was good enough for Mary. He was not good enough to be a Todd. And so they didn't want them to get married. And so in my opinion, Abraham Lincoln, who we know didn't have the best self-esteem when he was younger, mm -hmm. um, he broke it off because he knew he wasn't good enough for her. And she was too proud to say anything about it because she was incredibly proud person. So, and then he, whether he regretted it, which obviously he did, I think they were both too proud to reconcile for over a year, which eventually right. is what happened when mutual friends brought them together. But, you know, really everybody takes what Herndon said because he was Herndon and he knew the Lincolns for 25 plus years, but uh, everybody else said that, no, there was no, there was no, you know, leaving anyone at the altar. It was just, they broke up. Yeah. Yeah. And Doug Wilson's work of course is wonderful on, Absolutely. on that scenario. Well, we have one more question and it's a quick one. Uh, right. One of the viewers is just looking in awe at your background there with all the books. <laughs> and has asked what you're reading right now. Oh, wonderful. Um, you know, actually, I, uh, I just got a book. Uh, I'm taking a little Lincoln break. I just got a book. From oh, Steve. well, you're not allowed to say that. I know. I shouldn't <laughs> say that. But it's kind of related. It's about Chicago. There's a book. Uh, I just, it's just a brand new book from Southern Illinois University Press called, uh, I think it's called Tales of Old Chicago. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I just got it in the mail two days ago. I just started reading it. And it, you know, every chapter is a different story. So there's a story about the Great Fire and was it really started by O'Leary's cow? And there's right. stories of haunted houses and gamblers and thieves and politicians. And I, I've really, I really love books like that, that each chapter is a new story. Right. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing that one right now. And then I have, uh, I have a few other good ones. Another what's next for me is Lincoln's greatest case by, uh, McGinty about the, uh, the bridge, the bridge right. case that Lincoln uh, did. I can't wait to read that one. I got that one recently as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for this wonderful talk and for answering these questions. And thank you all at home for watching again and for tuning in over the last few months. We are very grateful to our speakers for coming in in this sort of virtual reality and also to Fords for hosting these lectures. I will say to those of you at home, think about joining Fords Theater as a member. You can do that at Fords.org. Fords and their staff have been wonderfully supportive of the Abraham Lincoln Institute, and we are so grateful to them. And one way we can show gratitude for them putting on these wonderful events is by becoming a member at Fords.org. I want to wish everyone at home a, a safe rest of the summer and good health. I hope we can reconvene at Fords Theater in March of 2021 for the next Abraham Lincoln Institute Symposium. Until then, I am Jonathan White, wishing you all well and st- uh, staying safe. Take care.